Welcome to Casual Friday. So a few things to talk about today, and you can always jump to any particular section in the video uh, with the links down in the description. So I have an article, a technical knitting article in the new issue of Interweave Knits. It's the fall 2019 issue, and it's on the perfect neckline, how to pick up stitches like a pro. Apparently the on sale date is August 12th, but it's already available online as a digital download. All of the patterns um, from the issue are available to see on Ravelry. Usually there at some point in we will put a link to the technical knitting articles that are in the magazine that put that on their blog. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but the last article that I had, I told you about, I think last month, which is um, in the fall issue of Knit Scene, that there is an article on reading cable charts. And uh, when I told you about this before, they hadn't posted the link on to the website yet, but they have it now. So what I'm gonna do is put a link down in the description to my Ravelry group. I have what they call pages where you can put like links or information about things that pertain to that group. And I have a page that is links to all of my interweave articles. So whenever the link to the new article on picking up stitches is available, you'll be able to find it in that page. And you'll be able to find the, art the article right now to the one on reading cable charts. So again, I'll put the link down in the description. So in the past few months, I've talked about Interweave quite a bit because they were owned by a company called F&W Media, who owned more than 100 different magazines of all different types, a lot of craft magazines, but also other hobby-related magazines like photography or astronomy. They owned Writer's Digest, all of those kinds of magazines. And for many of those uh, publications are also associated uh, book publications and videos and other communities or websites. So they went into Chapter 11 bankruptcy. They filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy back in, I believe it was March. And then and that was to give them protection from their creditors until they could reorganize and arrange to sell off all of their parts. And so I've talked about that in the past. So all of the books went to Penguin Random House, and then they had an auction a week or so after that for what they called the communities, which were the magazines, the websites, the, the conferences, all of that sort of related type of thing. Those went on auction and those got split up. Most of the craft related stuff went to a company called Peak Media Properties. So Interweave and all the magazines that I write for are now part of Peak Media Properties. In the past week, there's been another development. So while Peak Media Properties won most of the craft-related communities, there was a backup bidder called Long Thread Media. And it turns out that Long Thread Media is a new company founded by Linda Ligon, Anne Marrow and John Bolton. Anne Ligon was the woman who founded Interweave years ago, and then she ended up selling all of the Interweave-related things to F&W Media. Anne Merrill was an editorial director at Interweave, and John Bolton at one time was a general manager of Interweave. So those three got together and they formed this new company, and they just bought three of the publications from Peak Media Properties. They bought Spin Off Magazine, which is a magazine for spinners. They bought uh, Hand Woven, which is for weaving. And then they bought Piecework Magazine, which is a magazine that's devoted to needlework of all types. They have an annual knitting issue, but they do other things too. They talk about quilting and they talk about applique and embroidery and, and other sorts of things as well. So those three people have formed a company and have bought those three magazines. So it'll be interesting to see what develops from that. Spinoff Magazine used to host an annual spinning conference that spinners still talk about today. And those conferences ceased to occur once F&W Media bought the magazine. So it'll be really interesting to see what develops from all of this. And I'll keep you posted as I hear more. 
So last week I introduced you to this 1930s vintage sweater. It's called a Popular Model and it was produced by the William Briggs Company in 1938. And I had gotten the back and the two fronts done and I had spent some time telling you the mistakes I had made that I'd ripped out and redone and some of the alterations. And the, the main modification I had made was to the circumference of the sweater. So the original sweater comes in just one size and it's at 32 slash 34 inches and I needed 38. And because the original sweater you just cast on and you work up straight, I did the same thing in my size. I cast on the number of stitches I needed for a 38 inch um, sweater and I started down here and went all the way up. And and it was big on my dress form here. My dress form is smaller than me. This came, this is like a store display dress form. And so I always expect it, things to be bigger on the dress form than it's going to be on me. But I was looking at all of the blousing and I was looking at the original photo of the pattern and I realized how close fitting it was and how not just that the mod model was more slender, but that she really was didn't have much of a waist like she she didn't go in or out very much she is very straight more of a rectangular shaped body than I have and I realized that I should not have made the sweater 38 inches around down here that the effect of that was to create a lot of blousing and that what I should have done was cast on just as the pattern had stated but to gradually increase up to the number of stitches that I needed for the bust. So I knew last Friday I was gonna have to rip everything out. Um, and so I did make those changes and what I did was I kept the original cast on number as it was and right before I worked this second uh, garter ridge here, I did an increase at the side and then I did them four times altogether. I needed to add four stitches to each side of the front and each side of the back in order to get the correct number that I needed um, to fit me. So I have four decreases or four increases going up on each side of the seam line for each piece. And then because I had that, those four extra stitches, I put one of them at the underarm. So instead of binding off eight stitches, I bind off nine. Um, at the front here, I left the button band just as it is, uh, but there were six stitches going, or five stitches going across here and 10 across in the back. So five here and five here. So I did one extra stitch here and then I did two extra stitches here. And then the way that this um, diagonal line is shaped is through short rows and, and working all the way across, stopping one stitch short of where it stopped the previous time each time, each time, each time. And so by adding two extra stitches in the width, I added four extra stitches in the length. The other change I made was, this originally was supposed to have five repeats of, the, of these, and I'm a little long in the body, so I did six of these repeats here. So those are the changes that I've made. And now I'm going to be working the yoke. <laughs> Finally, I'm gonna be able to get past the point where I was before. But one of the things that I had done, when I had done all of this the first time, when I had done the entire right front, I didn't like the edge of the button band, and so I ripped it all out and re redid it. And when I had done that the original time, I just ripped everything out and wound it up in a ball again, and it was kind of a pain because I'm actually using two strands of yarn, two strands of sport weight yarn to make uh, Aran weight yarn. And... So I had these two strands of yarn and I was rewinding and there was kind of a mess like where one ball would end and, the, uh, and then the next one would begin and then I get the tails and they, would, they were tangling. It was a real mess. So when I needed to redo the entire thing, rather than frogging everything and winding it all back up into balls, instead cast on and was knitting as the other piece was ripping out. So that worked really well for me. Then I didn't have, to, I didn't have any problems with uh, tangling. I didn't have to rewind balls of yarn. I didn't have two strands wrapping around each other. I just knit from one to the other and it worked out really well. For each of the pieces, each of the pieces, I have extra yarn left over for those pieces because I did start with fewer stitches and increase uh, gradually. So you can see I still have um, some of the ribbing left from one of the pieces um, that's that's attached to here. So next week, <laughs> hopefully I'll at least have the yoke done. The yoke 
is everything's live actually I, I worked this piece and I really what I still need to do on this particular piece is the working yarn is up here is I need to um, come down and I, I pick up the running thread between each of these um, slipped short row edges and I do an increase so the number of stitches I have along here is going to double and then I'll get all the way back to the beginning of the buttonhole band these are all still in separate pieces there's only two stitches at the top of each of the shoulders and what's going to happen now is I'm going to uh, knit across all of the stitches and I'll start working the ribbing pattern and so these these two stitches that are at the shoulders like this are actually going to end up turned uh, and become part of the edge of the yoke so that's you have to have a really small number of stitches there to make that work so this is something I've never done before that's really interesting and then the yoke is is um, limited to just the the shoulders so that the sleeves are going to have sudden sleeves which is different than a, to a typical yoke sweater that you see these days where the the yoke comes all the way down to the underarms um, I don't really like the way those fit I really like a separate a separate sleeve so this is going to be interesting for me to see what the potential uh, ways of using that technique the short row technique with the the increases and then to see how uh, th this yoke technique might be able to be used in other sorts of sweaters my microphone uh, cable just died so we're gonna have to deal with the camera mic sorry it's probably going to sound a little echoey now, because I'm at the same place I was the last week in my vintage sweater after having re-knit the entire thing, if you're interested in hearing more about why I chose that particular sweater pattern as my next vintage project and some of the unique characteristics of that sweater, you can check out last week's Casual Friday video where I go into a lot of detail about some of the techniques that are used. So the August sock knit along is is plugging along and it's been really delightful to see people, particularly people with really challenging um, fit issues, to see uh, how we can plan a sock for them that is going to fit. So I'm really excited to see how, um, especially the people with really challenging fit issues, see how they progress as we get through. Now some of the people decided before the knit along started to kind of knit what they would call a muslin version of a sock. Like if you've ever done any sewing construction, sometimes people will do a muslin practice um, garment to see if, if the fit issues are going to uh, work out before they actually invest in cutting out the actual fabric. So some people have done with thicker yarn and maybe with a shorter leg just trying out different heels on two different socks to see which adjustments and modifications they liked better and before they headed into their main socks so that's really neat. I just saw uh, yesterday somebody saying that they're three quarters of the way through a sock that fits them for the first time so it's really interesting to see the number of people who have knit lots of socks and but have never been able to fit to knit a pair of socks that fit them. I have one woman from Baja, Mexico, Baja, California, which is in Mexico, who's, who knit socks for her entire family, and everybody loved them, but her, her, she had one sister who has fit issues, and the socks, she couldn't wear the socks, so she's really looking to be able to knit her sister a pair of socks that fit her. So that's, that's fantastic. When I first started knitting socks, I was really interested in trying out a lot of different types of heels and one of the things that I noticed right away was that I can't wear my kids and I and my mother can't wear peasant heels or couldn't wear short row heels because they just they we couldn't get them on our feet they were so or if we got them on they were so uncomfortable we didn't want to wear them some of the advice that I was given about uh, how to adjust for a fit was tended to be very vague and didn't do enough for me and so I I couldn't figure out how to actually make something work without tr trying to knit one sock after another, after another, after another, and trying uh, one thing at a time. And even then, even if I was able to get something that fit a specific person, I didn't know how to figure out if 
if that type of heel was going to fit somebody else. Like I didn't know how, how to apply what I had learned for myself. How would I apply that to somebody else? So that's why a couple of years ago, I really sat down to figure out how can you predict how something's going to fit or what some, what someone's going to need in a fit and what the sock that you're knitting for them is going to uh, produce if you use the formula. So how do you adjust things? And I'd, I'd done a lot of reading on modifications, on Ravelry and different groups to try to see if, if anybody had come up with, here's how you, how you plan it. And it typically, it was very vague. Oh, use 60% of the stitches or, oh, I just add a couple of stitches with a little gusset before I make my sock heel. And there was nothing specific that I could really uh, hold on to and understand and be able to predict. Um, the, what the fit, how the fit was going to turn out. So I, I sat and I really figured out, well, what is the sort of the geometry of this, of the short row and the peasant heel? And so how do you manipulate that geometry to get what you want? And that's, that's what I came up with. So there are modifications that exist that can be done that I didn't include in my video series. But what's interesting to me now is the heel flap and gusset construction and and predicting fit at the beginning of the gusset and and sort of sort of anticipating how many stitches do you need on your needles at the beginning of the gusset based on your foot shape and this is something i had never thought of before because i just thought oh well if you knit the heel long enough if you knit the heel to the your actual heel length then it's going to fit you. But some people will say, no, no, it's too big around or it doesn't fit me right or it does this or that. And I thought, well, how can that be? And But the more people say, well, here's my fit issues, here's my fit issues. And I'm like, oh, there's really a wider range of foot shapes than I ever imagined, which is good to see. And I really um, am loving seeing this sort of thing. So if you have tried a heel flap and gusset construction and it hasn't fit you, um, and not because it's it's too tight, which is a common thing, but if it's too loose, like if you've had that experience of knitting a heel flap and gusset construction and it's been too big around at the beginning of the gusset, I really love to hear from you and get a few more particulars because I'm working on a theory right now, working on um, some things right now to help predict and because it isn't just the length of the heel flap that makes a difference it's also the type of turn that you use and because different turns will result in different numbers of live stitches in some cases some of the old-fashioned types of heels result in no stitches after the turn so I, I'm really exploring all of these different types of heels. A lot of them are in Weldon's Practical Stocking Knitter, which I have talked about many times. That was published in 1885 or 1886. And I've been really examining what they're saying about picking up stitches and, and the formulas that they use. And it's clear from their formulas that they're expecting that you will have a specific number of stitches after you've picked everything up. And so they direct, based on the type of heel, they're telling you when to pick up more stitches or when not to. And I found that really interesting. So what I'm trying to figure out is how to determine how many stitches you will need, not based on a formula, but based on your actual um, foot. And so I found a way to predict it that is working for me, but I am a sample size of one. So I'd really like to be able to figure out if I'm really onto something. And then that could be used for people who are using a heel flap and gusset construction to say, oh, well, if I use this type of heel, that's going to work for me and get me to the stitch count that I need. Or if I use this type of of heel and that will help me. So that is something I'm really interested in. If you are interested in helping me out with that, I would love to hear from you. So I have this bag that I guess gotten so, so full. I don't know if I'll be able to put any more in, but these are the kinds of things I do. You'll see these, these red and yellow ones are in my videos on peasant heels and short row heels where I tried uh, different ways of modifying and then I tried them out on my own foot to see 
uh, how they fit and for the most part all of them fit I don't always like the way some of them look and I, and not all of them are going to be useful in every sock situation depending on if you have uh, certain stitch patterns you need to maintain or certain things that you want to do visually in your sock some of these aren't going to work but these are all featured in my peasant heel short row heel uh, socks. Uh, this is this heel right here is what's called the common heel. Uh, what you'll see on the back is something that they always did, certainly in the in the 1800s, but probably uh, up into World War One they often did this, where they had what they called it the seam line. So they would after they worked the ribbing, they would add an extra stitch so that you would have an odd number of stitch on the back of the leg, and that odd stitch would create this seam line that was actually worked in a garter stitch so every other round you'd see this little pearl bump and it could help you count rounds so that you could keep track of how long something uh, how long you would knit something and if you were using shaping like decreases you'd work them on either side of the seam line so if I had uh, 32 stitches plus that odd one to make 33 if I had 32 stitches not counting the the seam stitch then I'd work for 32 rows and then when you get to the bottom the standard method was to bind off and then seam it closed what I did was a three needle bind off on the inside which is a little flatter and would be more comfortable but can you imagine having that bulky seam right underneath your heel but that's what would form the heel and you get this kind of sharp corner here that's gonna stick out a little bit uh, under under at the back of your heel the next version is the manufacturer's heel. You knit as many rows as you have stitches and then you work these decreases here and in this case I grafted shut rather than um, seamed or did done the, and you I still have like a little bit of a nipple here. I think if I had done uh, some kind of technique I don't know that I did one here I don't I did this a long time ago to reduce dog ears that that might help but at least you get a little bit of shaping here and then you also get this addi additional length which helps to create some fabric under the heel here rather than then pulling that heel down underneath here so you have all of this um, extra fabric from having worked uh, a few more rows in order to do that shaping for the the heel. So this is the first type of shaping that you could get. So what I'm trying to figure out for a heel flap and gusset construction is is figuring out ahead of time how you know depending on the type of heel turn you use how many stitches is that going to result in and how many stitches do you actually need? Is there a way to predict how many stitches you actually need so that you can choose a heel turn that helps produce that. So, th so this is what I'm looking for. Like the Victorians had some kind of idea about what they wanted this stitch count to be. And I'd like to figure out what that stitch count should be for any given person. And I think that it's that this stitch count is going to be based on that heel diagonal, but not the same percentage that you have when you are working a sock uh, with a short row like this uh, where you have this diagonal because th this kind of heel turn is very different from one that is just like this. So these produce different results. So I'm trying to figure out what do you actually need if you're using this kind of construction. So one of the things I'm experimenting with right now is using a very short heel flap along with a short row heel in order to produce a, a better fit across that diagonal. And I've had that suggested in the past in the same sort of way that I have had, well, just use more stitches for the heel or just add a few stitches for the heel. It's never been really specific and I want to be able to figure out specifically how to make that work for me. How long should that flap be? How many stitches should I pick up? And so that I could give that kind of a recommendation to somebody else based on what their foot measurements are. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.